Brilliant. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so group two was focused on extreme weather for electricity systems. Um, and ooh, so the kind of objective was to explore this kind of challenge around how, um, as I'm sure most of you know, UK and Europe are targeting kind of net zero emissions in the future, which means transitioning to this highly renewable electricity system. That means the system will become more um, sensitive to changes in weather and climate and also kind of these extreme adverse type weather scenarios. Um, so it's important that we kind of un better understand how resilient future energy systems will be and so to try and kind of help um, address that kind of challenge um, the Met Office have been working with the National Infrastructure Commission and the Climate Change Committee um, to develop this gridded meteorological data set of adverse weather scenarios and that's been released this month so the kind of objective of this hackathon was to kind of just explore this data set and think of around ways that this data set could be used to help um, understand this challenge around extreme weather. Um, so just a little bit of background about the data set. So it basically is sort of time slices, so years of um, gridded daily meteorological data uh, on surface temperature, 100 meter wind speed and surface solar radiation covering the European region. And within those time slices, there are long duration adverse weather events ca characterizing three different forms of adverse weather events so wind drought peak demand events in the winter the same sorts of events in the summer and then also the kind of opposite challenge where there's too much generation so summertime surplus generation events uh, and there are events that focus on uk only and then on europe as a whole and then there are events um, shared um, that relate to lots of different kind of extreme levels. So events that would, you would expect to occur once every two, five, 10, <clears throat> 20, 50 and 100 years. And the data set represents different climate warming levels and available to download on the CEDAR archive. And here's just a screenshot of the data set on the CEDAR archive. Um, and I definitely welcome anybody to, to kind of take a look at that and give me any feedback on, on their use of it. So kind of going back to this, um, so the kind of the solution concept for the hackathon was very broad. It was kind of just explore the data set and this could be done in a number of ways. And participants were basically encouraged to contribute their own ideas and thoughts on how we could do this. Um, so one of the suggestions was sort of data visualization, kind of creating interesting plots um, to, and risk maps of the data. The second uh, was data comparison, so kind of putting the, the events themselves into context of different data sets. And thirdly, um, exploring actually the resilience of uh, the energy system during these adverse weather events. So using the data within power system models to explore kind of how extreme is too extreme and do, do the, uh, these adverse weather events um, cause issues within the electricity system. So a few people um, had a go at some data visualization, which we'll show you in a second, but mainly it was kind of divided into two groups. So first of all, a data comparison group and secondly, um, an exploring energy system resilience group. So firstly, on the data visualization, um, this is just a, a Jupyter notebook that um, Hannah actually um, put together before the event, but that some, some members of the team kind of played around with and tweaked. Uh, and it basically produces some nice spatial fields and time series of the data. And I think I'll, I'll aim to add this to the CEDAR archive so that future users of the data can download this as well and uh, can look at the data. And I'll pass over to Noelia to talk about her data visualization. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, so here I took a look to one specific uh, most extreme event, uh, the uh, summer wind drought. So the aim uh, was just to look at uh, how many days of uh, winds extreme, low and high, uh, that would be in that uh, specific event. And I did the same for temperature uh, for the solar radiation. And I also took a look at the combination of extremes when having a high or low temperature uh, and a high or low wind speed. So for example, this is a map Sorry. of high wind speed. And the next one, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be the maps for two specific events, uh, summer drought and winter drought. 
uh, when uh, the wind speed is uh, lower than uh, five meters per second. So yeah, as expected, the most interesting season in this case is summer uh, in the south of Europe. And then, uh, yeah, the next one is the compounding events when uh, considering, for example, a high temperature, higher than 90 percent, and wind speed above the five uh, meter per second. And when we have cold temperature and low wind speed, so there is no much going on in, for example, in uh, spring and autumn, but the interesting season here are, of course, uh, summer and, and winter. So yeah, that would be interesting to assess how these compound uh, events influence the, the energy system. So, because I think there has, there should be, there would be very, very interesting to see the combination of uh, specifically temperature and winds or what we have more than one extreme and how that's affect the, the power system. And yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, now to James to talk about the kind of group one data comparison sub project. Hi, um, I worked with Josh on this project. Um, we wanted to compare these the precess extreme um, weather events for electricity, uh, the climate projections with some other data sets. And we chose the era five reanalysis um, as a historical comparison for the weather data and the URED energy variables, which derived from MERA2. Um, with our approach, we uh, developed some transfer functions to convert the weather variables into energy demand. Um, and we focused on the UK weather um, and electricity demand. So these plots are showing um, the tercials for return period extremes. So in red is what happens one every two years as an extreme event, orange once in every five years, all the way down to dark blue, one in a hundred year events. Uh, the thick um, line is showing the lower tercile and the dashed line is the upper tercile. Uh, and there's three examples for each of these return periods. Um, so this gives you a sense of um, what sort of temperatures and what sort of wind speeds are experienced during these extreme winter wind droughts. Uh, and in the background is the era five reanalysis um, climatological dis probability distribution. Um, the next plot is showing demand. So we used a simplified version of Hannah's demand model to calculate the demand from era five. Um, we didn't have time to do a proper bias correction check or anything like that. So uh, that would be a future work. But what this is showing us um, it, it is um, that just looking at demand alone, it's giving you quite a lot. Um, or it, it, it's the demand corresponds quite well with the return period. So the highest return period, one in 100 years, is the furthest right. So demand is probably the most important aspect of this. Of course, wind power and to some extent solar power also play a part in um, being a stress driver for these events. Um, next slide. Sorry. Um, so uh, just a, a different aspect of this was trying to um, compare to the URED energy variables as well. So the two plots on the right are showing you the reanalysis, the era five reanalysis and the URED energy variables. And the plots on left show three example events. These were the most extreme winter wind drought events. Um, and the um, red shaded distribution is showing you um, each different day that occurred during the 30 or so days of the stress event, uh, where those lie. So they're all quite concentrated quite narrowly um, with respect to the distributions you can see on the right from the era five reanalysis and the URAD. Um, interestingly, the variance is much greater for the URAD, and I think that that's accurate. I think our demand model for reanalysis is um, not representing well the um, variance that we should expect from the climatology. It, it needs to be corrected. So that would be something to come back to in future. Um, so, 
a summary of the results, uh, we were able to explore the um, the importance of demand and different energy variables and how the transfer functions work, um, what some of the drawbacks are of using a simple model, how you might try and fix that. Um, th these notebooks are all available on the GitHub page, so if someone wanted to come and attempt something similar and work with this really cool data set, um, it's potentially a good place to start. Uh, and in future, it'd be really nice to dig into a bit more depth, trying to understand the different biases and differences in variance between the di different data sets um, to try and properly Im implement the WINS model that we didn't quite get working as we expected uh, and to make use of the solar data as well. Um, it would also be nice to look at the summer surplus and drought events. Thanks. Thanks, James. Um, and now Spiris to talk about group two. And Brilliant, what they so 10 minutes with. Thank you. I'll, I'll okay. So, Briefly. <laughs> um, so basically, um, we we then set up the um, the Calliope um, model to kind of try to assess whether extreme weather had an impact of, on on the reliability mainly of the power system. So we we took four um, cases uh, of events. Uh, one in 20 years, one in 50, and one in 100 years, and an extreme event. Uh, we were limited to UK and Ireland, but um, that's for just for um, running the model quickly. And um, we introduced a supply technology called load shedding to represent uh, shortages, so basically outages. Um, and um, they, we um, post processed um, four reliability indicators. Um, related to the energy that, that wasn't supplied and uh, customer interruptions mainly and the availability of the system. Next slide, please. So that's the procedure. I, I probably won't go through, the, through that because we probably don't have time, um, but um, that's uh, just a step-by-step um, -step process of uh, doing this. Next slide, please. And these are the results. So we um, um, we the, the four indicators uh, are shown in this graph, and you can see that uh, um, on the x-axis we have the uh, the event um, severity uh, essentially. So as you can see, uh, as the severity increases, the um, the reliability indicators also increase. And by increasing, we mean that basically we have more energy not supplied more unavailability in the system, more interruptions, and so on. So uh, there is a correlation. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, the, the, the next thing we, uh, we should be doing really, uh, if we were to take this forward, is to, to expand to the, um, uh, the whole of Europe um, and to um, uh, uh, um, look at other geographical domains and um, fix a couple of um, um, uh, things in the model that uh, were a little bit uh, restrictive and maybe expand to more resilient um, assessment methods, more, more um, detailed things like than, uh, a couple of metrics. Next slide, please. And uh, obviously we've learned a lot. Uh, I mean, I didn't know how to use Python before this week and now I do. Um, and um, also Jasmine is, is, is great. Um, and Calliope is, is a, a, a very nice model. And uh, yeah, we enjoyed this. I think uh, all of us did. Yeah. Um, great, thank you. That's it from Kruti. <coughs> Brilliant. That's a wonderful point to hear at the end that that uh, that people enjoyed doing it. That's that's especially nice to hear. Well done. Thank you. Uh, so, any questions for Group Two? I can see David has a hand up. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, Noelia, um, on your on your slides, um, it looked like for the particularly the compound events, there were there were extremely large numbers of days where effectively wind power which i think was the, uh, mm -hmm. the resource there basically just wouldn't be generating and i noticed also you mentioned oh well so it was sort of just the summer 
but actually there were also a, a non-trivial number of days also in the in the spring and autumn so yeah that's that's quite an important result if you're planning on hoping that your country is going to be wind powered for some yeah. point in the future yeah for sure uh, there is also one point because here for winds for example i use a fixed threshold mm -hmm. so i guess there's uh, we can expect a difference if we use another, for example, I think Lauren uh, said 3 or 3.5 meter per second instead of uh, winds. And here, for example, for temperature, I use a 90 percentile of the whole distribution for that year. Mm -hmm. So one thing to, what we could do is uh, to take another uh, fixed threshold for temperature using uh, maybe the whole distribution for longer period like for the historical data set or something like this but uh, definitely it's very interesting to see how this compounding effect the combination of different uh, extremes right the point you're going to need the most energy the least is produced yeah exactly great okay thank you um so stephen has a hand up as well okay thanks yeah, there are, again, t t maybe two parts here. The sort of technical part of this. Um, do you think there was some scenarios you would have liked to have seen in there? And, and I guess uh, which ones do you think should be, would be liked to be included maybe in a future iteration of that? Um, and the other one is more about the experience because actually these things are really useful for, I mean, so the Catapult, you know, wants to use these types of things in their energy system models. So maybe you could tell me a bit about your experience with using that tool. How easy is it to get to grips with them? Um, and I guess also then, obviously you shared some of your code. Um, so, I mean, we're sharing part of that. And if it was, can you maybe tell us about your choices for uh, the codes you use? Why Jupyter Notebooks, for instance, is, a, is, is one. Um, just to clarify on the first question, when you mean what events did you expect to see? What exactly? Yeah, so obviously you have this high wind events, the high solar events, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of different technologies we may see in the future or now, like is, did you, when you're using that data, do you think actually it would have been nice to send something a bit more on, on, on these types of events, or you maybe you would have liked to send something to impact yeah. a different technology? Yeah, I think there was definitely discussion around hydro and the want to include um, information around precipitation and snow and that kind of thing to help with that. Um, another key limitation of the data set, which has been uh, mentioned before, was how it's on a, a daily resolution and these power system models work more, you get more information from them on an hourly or sub hourly even uh, resolution. Um, does anyone else have any insights on kind of what they would have wanted from the data set? Um, well, so I suppose um, though I, I though I, I didn't get the chance to participate as fully as I wanted, um, the the reason behind the direction for some of the events did come from from myself in terms of particularly for the visualization, because you know there yeah we are making lots and lots of conversations about running countries wholly renewable and things like that, and as it currently states, for example, the UK uh, carbon intensity measure only includes supplied electricity. It doesn't have any mention of contracted del energy delivery. So it doesn't include any of the spinning gas turbine carbon, for example, which is nicely ignored from our low carbon energy system. So we need to know when we see these compound events because real carbon is gonna get produced even though it might not appear in our nice shiny um, headline figures. So, you know, low wind events are just as important as, as high wind events when things break because they have uh, they have commercial impact on providers um, and on consumers, because obviously we still have to pay for contracted with delivery and things like this. So, you know, to me, these sorts of events actually have a better economic reason for inclusion than some of some other types of events, which might be more niche in terms of you know both you know, sort of the the climate or weather interest, but also from the from the people you know the wind farm designer and things like that. I think also in in terms of the the kind of code that we used, um, I think Python was was kind of taken on as um, 
kind of being supported by Jasmine but we definitely had discussions around how we would have liked to have used R and maybe some like R shiny kind of um, things that I know that Noella said she'd worked on before as well um, does anyone else have any other comments on what coding languages were used well we provided Jasmine so. We provided yeah. Jasmine um, with and with that environment and gave a little tutorial and that, you know, and, and Jasmine is really set up, I think you could say now very much for the use of Python. So that's that's why we went down mm -hmm. and particularly with IPython notebooks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, brilliant. I think we should probably move on. Um, it's great to see lots of the complexities coming out here. There's We've, we've discovered in, in lots of places that there are there are kind of interesting nonlinearities in these systems, and uh, uh, in common with that, we have a we have a nonlinear uh, numbering system here. So after groups one and two, I think we're going to go to group five next. <laughs> 